Welcome back to Debrief. I'm Nareet Ben. For decades after the Holocaust, the Israeli Mossad secretly tracked and pursued Nazi criminals with a goal of bringing them to justice, or at least as much justice as could reasonably be provided. Some cases ended in clear success, most notable the daring capture of the architect of Hitler's so-called final solution, Adolf Eichmann. He was caught and captured in Argentina in 1960 before being brought to trial and executed. But this week, a trove of Mossad documents were open to the public. What they reveal, that as the Mossad captured Adolf Eichmann, they also found one of the other most notorious criminals of the Nazi regime living in Argentina, the so-called angel of death, Joseph Mengele. In those documents, the story of why they left him there and how he evaded the Mossad's capture for years to come. Joining us from Jerusalem is Ephraim Zuroff. He's head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and himself responsible for tracking down and bringing to trial some of the last remaining Nazis. Joining us from Moscow, Ronen Bergman. He got a hold of the classified documents behind the story and penned this week's New York Times piece, Why Did Israel Let Mengele Go? He's also author of the upcoming book, Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being here. So, Renan, I want to start with you. You have tracked, researched, reported the Mossad for decades. This is the first time we see certain details coming out about how Mossad operations like this actually happen. What surprised you most? Well, I must say that the extent of effort that was uh, put, uh, invested by Mossad through parts of the uh, 30 years of a manhunt after Mengele surprised me. Uh, numerous efforts, budget, recruitment of agents, uh, even using aggressive means, suggestions to abduct a 12-year-old kid whose father knew where Mengele is and, uh, and threaten the father to kill the kid if he doesn't uh, tell Mossad where's Mengele, uh, using torches, many, many efforts, uh, and a lot of clever, I would say, moves, um, recruitment of journalists, recruitment of, of, of former Nazis who in fact indicated where Mengele is. So this is, I would say, one surprise, the, the ability to look inside Mossad uh, operation. This is how Mossad operation looks like for the first time, first ever published uh, publishing documents of this kind. And the other thing is that the fact that Mengele evaded, evaded his, um, uh, his captures was not just because he was clever, and not just because uh, Mossad had bad luck, and not just because Mossad had made few um, profound professional mistakes. This is all true, but the main reason was that the chiefs of the Mossad recommended many of the prime ministers who accepted this recommendation to put the manhunt following Mengele uh, out of the priority list, or at least very, very low, which means that it, 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 it didn't really exist. Israel took a decision and a deliberate and a written decision, secretly of course, but a written decision in the um, Prime Minister's orders and Mossad protocols not to chase Joseph Mengele because there were other priorities. And as the former Mossad chief, the late Mayor Ami told me, I preferred to look at the present dangers, dangers and challenges of the past than chase ghost of the past. Ephraim, briefly before we go out for a quick break, what surprised you most when reading these documents? First of all, the fact that the Mossad was able to get incredibly close to Mengele and to identify him, and yet were unable to mete out justice, that's, uh, that's I think, one of the things. And, and as Ronan said, in other words, there was, it was quite a bit of effort invested in trying to find Mengele and in operations which would either lead to his capture and kidnapping or to his uh, liquidation. But having said that, the number of people whom the Mossad went after was relatively small. And this is, this is a very, you know, sort of problematic issue for Israel. So on the one hand, Israel is a country which faced existential security concerns from the day it was established. And there were other things that undoubtedly were more important than hunting Nazis. On the other hand, the results of the efforts of the Mossad were rather minimal. Ephraim Zuroff, Ronan Bergman, stay with me. We're going to go out for a quick break. We'll be right back here on Debrief. Don't go anywhere. 
We're back here on Debrief, continuing the conversation. A trove of documents from the Israeli Mossad made public this week and revealing the decades-long pursuit of Hitler's so-called angel of death, Joseph Mengele. Some incredible details, not only on how he initially escaped and evaded capture, but on how those kinds of operations were actually carried out. Still with me from Moscow, Ronen Bergman, author of the New York Times piece out this week, Why Did Israel Let Mengele Go?, and author of the upcoming book, Rise and Kill First. First. And with us from Jerusalem, Ephraim Zorov, head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and himself responsible for tracking down some of the last remaining Nazis. Ephraim, the Mossad began pursuing this man, Joseph Mengele, in 1960, based on tips from Simon Wiesenthal himself. How big of a priority, as far as you know, was this in that time period? First of all, I'm not in a position to say. I know that uh, there's no question that during the operation to kidnap Eichmann, the possibility was raised of kidnapping Mengele as well. Now, it ultimately turned out that Mengele had, a, had left Buenos Aires several weeks before the Mossad arrived. But an effort was made to see if that could be carried out. In other words, the two birds with, with one operation, uh, but it didn't happen. But then Mengele disappeared. He went uh, first to Paraguay, then to Brazil. But again, he, someone, in other words, the Mossad picked up his, his, his trail and was able to uh, reach a situation in which they actually, it's Viaroni, I think it was, uh, one of the agents actually saw him and uh, uh, the per saw a person who definitely fit the description of Mengele and was in the place where Mengele was, was supposed to be. But, it, it, it never happened. And if I may understand but again, that... you know, first of all, this report, this report, let me just explain something. These documents don't only deal with Mengele. There are quite a few other Nazi war criminals whom the Mossad thought of trying to liquidate, uh, such as Klaus Barbie, such as Walter Rauf, uh, Franz Mura. So, uh, in other words, this is really the first time that this story has been fully exposed. And what I'm curious about, that I don't have the answer, maybe Renee Bergman has the answer, is why on earth, why now, all of a sudden, this information was publicized? Well, Renan, let me let you answer that. Why, why now? Why reveal these documents at this moment in time? Um, well, the, the, the short... Uh, an easy answer is that uh, uh, we, uh, I have been collecting these documents for the last three years, uh, interviewing uh, the witnesses, uh, the people from the Mossad, um, including Israel, who passed away many years ago, uh, dealing with this. And when we reached a time uh, when I understood that I have enough documents, or I have most of the documents relevant from the Mossad archive, uh, we just came in and published it. I know that there was also an initiation to deliver some of the um, uh, documents to Yad Vashem, and because we have started, uh, Yad Vashem decided to early the time of uh, their publication. So it's just a coincidence. There's no, there's no real reason why it's happening now, only that we just could publish it. And I think, and this is very important uh, in general, that not just about that, especially about that, but about the hunt for Nazi criminals, as well as many uh, other important affairs, the Israeli intelligence community must give declassified much of uh, its archive and give a true report to Israeli citizens what had happened, um, how it succeeded, how did it fail. In many, many cases, the Mengele file, the Meltzer file, as it's uh, codename in the Mossad, and we are presenting part of the classified part of that, um, the Mengele file and other files, Mossad is controlling, is in possession of the only accurate uh, description of what really happened. Mossad file on Mengele tells us what exactly happened day after day since he left Auschwitz before the Russians came until he died in 1979. Mossad file tells us about two uh, of the occasions where Mossad was so close to him. Mossad tells us what were the efforts that were made to verify his death? And again, why was it that this efficient and lethal and sometimes aggressive intelligence agency wasn't able to settle the score, close the circle, so, and bring uh, Mengele to justice? So if, Ephraim, knowing that and knowing how each prime minister sort of, sort of had a different take on how big of a priority tracking down these Nazis actually was. With all your work, how do you reflect on the decision that was ultimately made by some of them that this shouldn't be a priority? 
First of all, I think we have to understand Israel's special circumstances. It would be absurd to claim that hunting Nazi war criminals should have a higher priority than, uh, for example, uh, working against the Iranian nuclear bomb or working against the German scientists who came to Egypt to build ballistic missiles that would be aimed to destroy Israel. So th that has to be clear. And in that respect, I think Israel has unique circumstances, which in a sense relegated a, a subject like this to a much lower priority. But having said that, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit problematic in my eyes for, for prime ministers basically to take it off the table completely. And in that respect, we know now that uh, Prime Minister Begin really took a, different, took a different approach. No matter what happened, it would be impossible to, to uh, you know, liquidate all the Nazi war criminals. And it would not have been a bad thing if someone like Mengele or someone like, uh, let's say, Bruna, for example, who, who the Mossad operated against and sent him two letter bombs, uh, would have been liquidated to send, uh, I think, a very effective message about what should be, you know, uh, how the Jewish state uh, seeks to deal with its enemies, even from the past, not only from the present. Gentlemen uh, and Renan, in the little time we have left, I want to talk about one uh, element from these documents that is perhaps one of the most shocking, which is the Red Cross's involvement. Explain that. So the first four, uh, three years of Mengele after the war uh, uh, happened in Europe because nothing was known about him. He was not a senior um, uh, decision maker with the Nazi party. He was not part of the, ex the, the, the extermination plan in the higher uh, echelon. So nothing was, uh, was very little discussed about him in, in the Nuremberg trial. He, he lived in Europe under his name for three years. Then in 1948, bits, of piece, bits and pieces of the stories came up and he decided to go to South America and he used false documentation from the Red Cross. The Red Cross was helping a lot, many. Um, Nazi war criminals to fled, and he's he received uh, with his, the friends of his friend in the SS false documentation on an Italian name Helmut Gregor, uh, and used that to fled to South America and lived there for for many years. By the way, this is shocking, but not less shocking is that the German embassy in Buenos Aires in 1956 gave Mengele under his name a full clearance of any criminal record. They gave him um, a, a, a full, a full uh, a description that he doesn't have a criminal and record, though they knew who he is. An incredible piece of history revealed. Ronen Bergman at Frimesdorf, thank you both very much for being